Good evening, Brian, and welcome along to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our lockdown lecture series, meeting number 100. We've eventually got there, Brian, we've got into uh, three digits. I, who would have thought I, back in March 2020 that we would be meeting every Tuesday night I, through a new technology called Zoom? I, but it's been a pleasure hosting you over the last... Uh, what's that, 100 weeks or so, <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to put on a uh, grateful thanks to my secretary, Brother Nobby Clark, who's pretty much been at every single one helping behind the scenes, so Nobby, thank you for doing so. Brian, I, as ever, can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines when it comes to Zoom meetings, please keep your video running and a recognisable name within uh, the little screen in front of me. Thank you, Brian. And please, uh, if you get a chance, please sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages. Brian, last week I, I intimated that we were hoping to have a brother coming from America uh, to talk to us about Freemasonry, Gnosticism and Christianity. Unfortunately, uh, a work commitment came up for him and he got in touch with me on Sunday evening asking to reschedule. Uh, with this being the, the penultimate meeting and uh, knowing that we were going to uh, end this lockdown lecture series with a burn celebration, I, I, I felt I didn't want to put the pressure on anybody else uh, and given them only 24 hours notice to pull together a presentation. And I've finished and it gave me the impetus to finish uh, a presentation that I've been sort of working on over the last 18 months which is the history of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, where we came from, what we've been doing over the last 160 years or so, uh, 180 years nearly, uh, and uh, a little bit about the future. So hopefully you feel that that's quite fitting for our 100th meeting and our penultimate meeting, Brian. So without any further ado, I shall try and share my screen. Uh, and take you on this little history lesson uh, of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and our journey from colonial India to being at the vanguard of mis global Masonic learning during the COVID pandemic. So the birth of Freemasonry in India, Brian, there was Freemasonry in India before the seed of Scottish Freemasonry was sown back in 1838. Uh, or 1738, that should be. Recorded history shows that within 12 years of the constitution of the United Grand Lodge of England, in 1717, a petition was received by it from a few brethren in India to constitute a provincial Grand Lodge in Calcutta. That petition was granted. Uh, the Grand Lodge of England issued a patent as early as 1729 to uh, George Pomfret, uh, appointing him as a provincial Grand Master to supervise Masonic activity in India and the Far East and authorising him to open a new lodge in Bengal. This was issued by James King, 4th Baron Kingston, Grandmaster Mason of the Grand Lodge of England. And that is uh, Baron Kingston on the right hand side of your screens, Brian. Uh, full details of that uh, meeting was uh, are preserved in the minutes of the United Grand Lodge of England. Uh, that First position being presented on the 28th of December, 1728. 28th of December brings a date that will uh, come up again during the next half hour. Uh, the text records the deputation from the Grand Master to empower and authorise our well beloved brother Pomfret that he do, in our place instead, constitute a regular lodge in due form at Fort William in Bengal in the East Indies. This was signed and sealed the 60th of February, 1728, and in the year of Masonry, 5732. And that just goes to show, Brian, that the, the usher's chronology of dating that we currently use and still do in the Grand Lodge of Scotland, if you look at your certificates, uh, was used back then. I'd like to introduce James Brown Ramsey, the first Marquis of Dalhousie to you. Uh, the annual communication of the Grand Lodge of Scotland held at Edinburgh on the 30th of November, 1836. The most forcible Grand Master Mason, Brother Lord Ramsey, during his address, informed the members that Brother Dr. James Burness uh, of the Honourable East India Company service was about to return to India. And he thought that the superior information and knowledge of masonry possessed by Brother Burness would be of the utmost importance in promoting the usefulness of the craft in that quarter of the globe. 
and as such, be begged to propose Brother Dr. Burness to be appointed Provincial Grandmaster over the provinces of Western India and dependencies, with the authority to establish lodges in those provinces. And Brian, you will recall uh, during this lockdown series, we had a very fascinating presentation on Burness by uh, Brother Ian McIntosh, uh, Master of the Lodge of Discovery up in Dundee. I, that was unanimously approved by Grand Lodge and uh, Burness was accordingly issued a commission dated the 30th of November 1836. He arrived in Bombay towards the end of December and without much messing around Brian, on the 1st of January he opened and established the Provincial Grand Lodge of Western India and its dependencies under Scotland and appointed his office bearers. And as Brother Ian informed us, uh, Brother Burns's great grandfather was an uncle of Scotland's famous poet Robert Burns, who was also had a similar spelling at that time. There was another, a second province uh, in India formed. It was a province of Eastern India, and that had the Marquis of Tweedale, uh, who was the governor of Madras, as its provincial grand master. On his uh, retirement, uh, the provincial grand lodge was absorbed under the jurisdiction of Dr. Burness who in 1846 became the Provincial Grand Master, having jurisdiction of all, of, over all of India, which included Aden, but with the premise that this appointment was not to act in restraint of any future subdivisions of the presidencies. So who was the Marquis of TDL? Uh, he was Field Marshal George Hill. He was a Scottish soldier and administrator, and he served as a staff officer in the Peninsular War under Arthur Wellesley. Uh, he was with Wellesley at the Second Battle of Porto, when they crossed the Douro River and routed Marshal Suits French troops in Porto. He also saw action at the Battle of Basuka and at the Battle of Vittoria. He later served in the War of 1812 and commanded the 100th Regiment of Foot at the Battle of Chippawa when he was taken prisoner of war. He went on to become the Governor of Madras and that's where he comes into our story, Brown. And at the same time, he was Commander-in-Chief of the Madras Army in which role he restored the discipline of the army, which had been allowed to fall into a relaxed state. But probably more importantly for us as Scottish Freemasons, he was our most worshipful Grand Master Mason during the years of 1818 to 1820. <clears throat> but after Burness's arrival, uh, for nearly six years, no Scottish lodges came into existence, apart from two dispensations issued by him for the formation of Lodge Hope number 337 at Karachi in 1842, and of Lodge Rising Star of Western India number 342 in 1843 at Bombay. <clears throat> Lodge Perseverance, uh, which is now number 330 under the Scottish Constitution, had previously existed under the English Constitution and later switched over to the Scottish Constitution. And Burness was its member when it was under the English Constitution. And our Lodge, Lodge Hope's number was 410, I think, beforehand, but it was renumbered uh, at that time when Perseverance came over and it took the, the just one greater number than Lodge Hope of Karachi. And you can see there uh, some imagery of the Lodge Rising Star of West India and uh, a banner for, from Lodge Perseverance uh, when it came over to the Scottish Constitution. And you can see the detail of the thistles there, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> talking about specifically the, the Lodge Hope of Karachi and our foundation, uh, on the 25th of April 1842, the Provincial Grand Master Brother Burness established uh, what was to become Scottish Freemasonry in India under this authority from the Grand Lodge by issuing a prov provisional charter, provisional, Brian, not provincial, but provisional charter to Bernard Karachi to form himself into a lodge styled Hope. The provisional charter is permission to hold meetings until a charter is issued by the Grand Lodge of Scotland and it will take its place and precedence from the provincial provisional issue on that date and the lodge was numbered 421 at that time. The inaugural meeting was held on the 17th of May, 1842, when brother Captain R.H. McIntosh was installed as Worshipful Master. And what a great name, to, excellent Scottish name to start Freemasonry, uh, Scottish Freemasonry over in India. And again, that's another uh, picture of Burness there, Bern. And the map gives you an idea of the, 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 the maroon colour is the province of Sindh, and where uh, Karachi is based is just about where the star is. Karachi, uh, back then, Brown was not much more than a fishing village, uh, situated about 700 miles northwest of Bombay, on one side of the Arabian Sea and the delta of the river Indus close by, somewhat similar to the town of Levin, uh, 
where uh, we were responding to, except that down and leaving on the, the Costa del Fife, uh, we don't have deserts and 120 degree Fahrenheit temperatures burn. And interestingly, today, Karachi is the largest city in Pakistan and the 12th largest city in the world. It's the capital of Pakistan's province of Sindh, uh, ranked as a beta global city. It's Pakistan's premier industrial and finance centre with an estimated GDP of 164 billion as of uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, Karachi is Pakistan's most cosmopolitan city, linguistically, ethnically and religiously diverse, as well as one of Pakistan's most secular and socially liberal cities. And thanks to Mr Google for that information about Karachi. Coming back to the lodge, uh, the, the office bearers of the lodge were duly installed. Thereafter, the following business was conducted. Uh, 20 articles of the new bylaws were approved. Uh, the lodge was passed to the second and brothers Fenning and Heyman, who has entered apprentices, signed the petition and were made fellows of craft. Four candidates were proposed and were duly initiated. A further five candidates were then proposed, thus indicating the Masonic enthusiasm in the regiment. The regiment, I'm going to come on to in a second round, but what was that regiment? Uh, the, the records tell us the meetings were thereafter held on Thursday at what, what was termed two o'clock noon. The one regular and four emergency meetings were held until the next installation, and they disposed of 23 new initiates, 10 passings and two raisings, and they were certainly busy. And I'd just like to think, Brian, uh, that this is uh, Brothers Fainan and Heyman sitting here uh, in the uniform of uh, the Cheshire Regiment. We know uh, that the first recorded minute reads, a warrant of dispensation having been received from the most worshipful James Burness, Provincial Grand Master of the North Western Provinces of British India, dated Bombay the 25th of April in the year of our Lord 1842 and of Freemasonry 5842, constituting and appointing Brother J.L. Pennyfeather as past master, R.H. McIntosh as first worshipful master, and A.H.O. Matthews and M. McMurdo as the first senior and junior wardens respectively authorising them to assemble a lodge for the purposes of Freemasonry and to be designated Lodge Hope, and pursuance thereof of the following Brennan Assembly at Karachi on the 17th of May, 1842, at 2 noon. At the time, Brennan, uh, Freemasonry was for the Europeans. Uh, it was for uh, those who were in the military or in the service of the East India Company. But there was one chap, uh, a Parsi gentleman uh, who's a merchant from Bombay. Uh, he was refused admission by Lord, Lodge Perseverance, but he didn't take that defeat very easily. He went out to Europe, went back to Europe. He was initiated in France. And after his return, his enthusiasm for the order, coupled with the support he received from uh, Burness, the provincial Grand Master uh, at the time, he, that led to the establishment of Lodge Rising Star of Western India, number 342. Again, look how close on the roll of numbers burn. And that was consecrated on the 15th of December, uh, specifically for the purpose of introducing native gentlemen into the craft. And his name was Manikji Kursiji. Some of you will recognise uh, Brother Brian there. Uh, he's recently uh, been out, he's been working out in Hong Kong and he's uh, currently the District Grand Secretary of the, the Far East. And he's visited a uh, Lodge Rising Star. And uh, their website, Brian, states that Lodge Rising Star is the first lodge founded for admitting the natives of India to the privileges of Freemasonry. At the time of its institution in 1843, there were supposed to be many different difficulties in the way, difficulties of race, difficulties of social custom, of political uh, equity, differences of enlightenment, and perhaps many others. But there were stout hearts who, headed by James Burness, maintained and desired to prove that Masonry belonged to no creed or colour to no climate or race, it was a universal patrimony of mankind. It was the one touch of nature that makes the whole world kin. And the Lodge Rising Star thus came into existence. The foundation of that lodge has broken the spell of ages. What, what lovely words, Brian. The foundation of that lodge has broken the spell of ages. So, Brian, the Lodge Hope of Karachi is the oldest Scottish lodge in India. And uh, took its rightful place at the, the top of uh, the precedence over there. Uh, Brother Bommy Mehta, who is known to many of you here this evening, uh, he's written a fantastic history of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Western India, and it is with great credit 
to Bommy that he's allowed me to share some of that information with you this evening. But who was that regiment that I mentioned and what is our military antecedents? We know that the lodges descended from military and colonial origins. Uh, the first of the Masonic formations was the issue of a military charter issued in 1769 as a travelling lodge in the name of Mariah, uh, Colonel Wedderman's Lodge, and the 22nd Regiment of Foot, what became the Cheshire Regiment. This was an English county regiment consisting of soldiers, uh, described as mainly the fighting Irish, and officers, mainly Scots. That produced an awesome combination in the many battles and wars which they were involved in with maintaining the empire. Uh, it was uh, an Irish chapter that they were given Brown, and that is a, a depiction of a soldier of the 22nd in the, the mid 1700s. The regiment was originally issued that travelling warrant from the Grand Lodge of Ireland, uh, but they lost it uh, during their posting to the Mississippi about 1759. And until they received the military charter that they'd requested from, the, from Scotland, uh, we know that the Brown followed in the Irish fashion uh, and what they were meaning by that, it was informally to maintain the interests of the Brown. Having been 6,000 miles away in three months sailing time, uh, the Grand Lodge of Scotland were, were not being able to bring them under control uh, before they were posted to some other parts. Uh, Brian, with the, the, the changes of the, the, the naming and the, the numbering of the regiments, uh, the county designation we know existed as early as 1772, uh, but in 1782, the regiment was retitled to 22nd Cheshire Regiment of Foot. And you can see uh, some of the places that they, they've fought over the years. But Miani and Sind here are the two that we'll look at a little bit more closely. I'd like to introduce to you at this point, Brother Lieutenant General Sir Charles Napier. Uh, in 1842, I uh, think about the dates, Brian, and uh, that's the date of the foundation of uh, the Lodge Holbrook Grachy. At the age of 60, Napier was appointed Major General to command of the Indian Army, to command the Indian Army within the Bombay Presidency. Uh, Lord Ellenborough's policy led Napier to Sindh province uh, for the purposes of quelling the insurrection of the Muslim rulers who remained hostile to the British Empire following the First Anglo-Afghan War. Napier's campaign against these chieftains resulted in victorious victories in the Battle of Mina against General Hushe Shire at the Battle of Hyderabad and then the subjugation of the Sindh and its annexation by its eastern neighbours as the Sindh Division. And you can see a, a, a statue of a, the Sindhi legend Hush Mohammed Shire uh, that's in Hyderabad and that is a, an artist's impression of what he looked like, Brian, uh, because they, they actually... He, he was of African uh, descent as well. But as the, the, the regiment was moving uh, northward with Napier uh, to Sindh, in November 1842, the Lodge sought permission from Provincial Grand Lodge to grant authority that the true principles of Freemasonry could actually be extended to the upper Sindh, uh, as they knew that they were being ordered there. And on the 17th of February 1843, the 22nd was the spearhead of Napier's force, which won the Battle of Miani. The regiment uh, conducted itself with distinction and bravery and received the highest commendations from their commander. That commander was incidentally made the first honorary member of our lodge, and that was Brother Lieutenant General Sir Charles Napier. But who was Napier? He was the eldest son of uh, Colonel, the Honourable George Napier, and his second wife, Lady Sarah Lennox, uh, both being second marriages for them. Lady Sarah was the great granddaughter of King Charles II. Napier was born at the Whitehall Palace in London. So, Brian, does that give us, as the Lodge Hope of Karachi, some claim to have royal connections? Who knows? For some of the romantics in the room, possibly we can. Uh, he grew up, uh, he joined the 33rd Infantry Regiment in 1794, quickly transferred to the 89th, uh, went back to school in Ireland. Uh, however, he further took up active service in 1799. What do we know about his Freemasonry? Uh, he was initiated into Doyle's Lodge in Guernsey. Uh, that lodge was warranted in 1806, uh, he consecrated uh, it's number 336, September 22nd, 
Uh, they had their centenary warrant dated the 6th of September 1906 and their 200 years September 2006. Uh, Doyle's Lodge uh, had its genesis in the exciting and dangerous days of the early 1800s. Just imagine watching Hornblower burn and that sort of thing. Uh, Guernsey had experienced unrivaled prosperity and growth as a consequence of the American Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. And privateering was then a legitimate commercial enterprise and wealth flowed from that activity. Uh, we know he was only on Guernsey for a few short weeks and uh, that, that's the crest uh, of uh, Doyle's Lodge and it is the, the crest that is on their uh, past masters, Jules Brown. Uh, and you, you can see the connection with the military uh, there. Uh, but uh, he, he, he was initiated past and raised all within that uh, very short spell in Guernsey. Uh, Napier went on to become uh, the governor of Sindh, uh, and as governor, he granted to the lodge a plot of ground in Karachi uh, so that we could build a Masonic temple. This goal uh, was achieved in 1845, and the foundation stone was laid by uh, General Napier. In the hall, there was a tablet bearing the following description, and you can see one of the tablets at the top of the stairwell there, Brown. This Masonic temple was erected by subscription of the following Brown, and there was 30 named Brown. Uh, the foundation stone was laid by Sir Charles Napier, governor and conqueror of Sindh on the 4th of September, 1845. That's the building as it stands today, Brown, or the, the exterior elements of the building. And we've got a lovely story that I'd like to recall that was published in uh, the Express Tribune on the 28th of April, uh, 10 years ago uh, now. <clears throat> and it tells us a, a story about a family. Uh, Prabhu Sonaveria, who began serving in 1905 as superintendent of the Hope Lodge, he served for 45 years. Superintendent Mbrern is, uh, in other words, for Jani, a uh, housekeeper, a uh, butler. Uh, his son Jivan uh, tells a story about his life uh, and his father's work. And he paints a delightful image of life under the Raj and evenings at the Hope Lodge. Its well-heeled members, Englishmen, Muslims, Parsis, Hindus, began to arrive at 6 p.m. rolling up in their Austins or Victoria buggies, some strolling in as the sun began to set. The Hope Lodge was among the few clubs in Karachi. The YMCA, the YMCA Javan recalls, was where foreigners often stayed. Food, alcohol, it was a very busy place, he said. The other establishments were the Sin Club and the Union Jack Club, now known as the Services Club. The lane where the Karachi Press Club is now located used to be called the, the Royal Air Force Line, where government employees lived. Fawara Chowk, he says, used to have a statue as years passed, all, thing, all the old things went. He, he, he continued to recall that the food for the British members came from the Boat Club and later years the Metropole Hotel while the native members would often eat food prepared by the caretaker's family. The English liked the baked stuff, or custards and puddings, recalls his wife. Uh, as his family has served the lodge since it was built in 1842, her mother-in-law, Gangabai, also cooked for the lodge. And you can see here, Brian, some of the, uh, the, the names on the, the plaques that were, were still in the lodge. And there was nine Masonic, uh, entities uh, meeting there uh, at the time. Uh, Jeevan's father, Prabhu, migrated to Karachi in 1905, and that's a photograph of him uh, outside the, the temple. Uh, and after 45 years of service at the lodge, he suffered an attack of paralysis and the members offered his job to his eldest son. Jeevan took over from his brother and served until the closure of the Hope Lodge. And through those decades of service, Jeevan says the management treated him with respect. He stated, these British knew that they would only be here for a couple of years and then someone else would come. But we would continue to stay here. They never once pointed a finger while talking to us. We had free use of the place. They would allow us to put up a tent and hold wedding ceremonies here. So you can just imagine, Brian, them all, uh, the, the distinctions and the, the separation, but there was a level of respect. And I like to believe that was because of our Masonic principles. One of the large traditions that I, I've learned about, and is one that I, I think that we really should look to instigate, was that annually 
on the anniversary of the Lodge's founding. The, remember, uh, the Brown remembered the founders in a very special way. Uh, the Lodge was called to order in the third degree. A bugle sounded the last post from the west. The role of the founders was called by the master, the founding brothers being Pennefather, McMurdo, McPherson, Dilly, McIntosh, Orr, Heyman, Fenning, Matthews, Bembo. And this was then followed by Ravalli being sounded from the east. What a lovely tradition, Brian. And you can see uh, a bugler uh, and of that time uh, of one of the regiments of foot. Uh, albeit this is not a, uh, the, the Scottish Lodge, this is a photograph that I found, Brian, of the Alexandra Lodge, uh, English constitution, uh, around a similar time. And you can just see the sort of uh, the period dress uh, that, that, that they're wearing uh, there. And I think that's how our members would have looked like. So Richard Francis Burton, we, we do as a lodge have a, a celebrity, I would imagine, uh, at least a very famous man. Uh, Burton was a British explorer, writer, scholar and soldier. And he was famed for his travels and explorations in Asia and Africa and the Americas, as well as his extraordinary knowledge of languages and cultures. And according to one count, he spoke 29 European, Asian and African languages. His best known achievement, uh, arguably is the, the well-documented journey to Mecca that he made in disguise at a time when Europeans were forbidden to access uh, Mecca on pain of death. Uh, an unexpurgated translation of 1001 Nights. And Brian, I, a book some of you may be aware of, the, the Kama Sutra, and he translated that into English. Uh, and he also took a journey with John Hanning Speak uh, as one of the first Europeans to visit the Great Lakes of Africa in search of the source of the Nile. <clears throat> the other thing that I found interesting when I was uh, interrogating the periodicals of uh, Freemasonry over the years, that in 1896, uh, one of our members who'd come back from India, I uh, must have had a crystal ball looking at our future as a lodge. And I came across this article in the Inverness Courier, uh, showing that our members of our lodge have been given Brian a daily advancement in Masonic knowledge for over 100 years. And although it's not that clear in writing, what that article states is uh, St Mary's Lodge. On Wednesday evening in Freemasons Hall, Brother DJ McIntosh of Lodge Hope, Karachi, India, delivered the second of the series of lectures arranged for by the lodge, entitled A Freemason's Experience at Home and Abroad. Brother McIntosh dealt particularly with his own travels in India, Egypt and Canada, relating many curious customs had as, uh, he had observed among the people and during his travels of these countries. He was heartily thanked for his lecture. The next lecture falls to be delivered on the 20th by the Reverend Canning Brook. So the Lodge Hope of Karachi Brown, we've been providing lecture on Masonic uh, education for well over a hundred years. <clears throat> However, things were to change for the Lodge Brown. Uh, partition was never going to be easy after the war and separating uh, two countries, India into Pakistan and vice versa. Uh, Bhutto uh, was beginning to struggle with uh, retain his power. And one of the things that he did trying to gain the support of the Islamic voters, he outlawed Freemasonry. Uh, he denounced it as being anti-Islamic since its roots and the rituals were of arguably Jewish. Uh, lodge Hope, we know, was mainly a Christian lodge as it was begun by the Christians at the time, the, the Europeans. Local members of the other Masonic bodies, uh, the Indians were, were Hindus, they, they were not Muslim. So Bhutto banished the craft uh, and all its properties were seized. The lodge was sealed and all of its contents consisting of furniture and records. Uh, the cabin trunks that the Brown kept in the building for stone, the regalias and the ritual and the memorabilia, all that was lost. And most of the, organ the records of the nine other organisations sh that shared the building were seized. And despite requests, Brown are still in Pakistan, if they've not already been totally destroyed. The lodge was disbanded and for a time the building was unused. Uh, but in recent years, it's been used as a Sindh Wildlife Department, and you can see a picture of it 
uh, the, the library of the wildlife department there. But what to me is very interesting that you can see the, the sort of parky form here, Brian. But look, what's this? Checkered pavement. Uh, so the Sin Wildlife Department are still walking up through that checkered carpet that we once went round and round and round. So repondment, Brian, after dormancy, those years of darkness, repondment. And what did that look like? The history books tell me a fresh concept for further Masonic knowledge and interest was raised in 1987. Uh, the initial idea being based on the English constitutional practice of having a past master's lodge, and possibly, and quite probably, in my opinion, based on the Lodge Sir Robert Murray that was founded by Lord Delgan, our provincial Grand Master at the time, to become our research lodge in Edinburgh. The principles being to preserve and present the Masonic knowledge, rituals and lectures which have been collected over many years by them. These then to be introduced to the younger and Masonic years, Brian, thus adding to the education by their own respective lodges. The original idea was discussed with six local past masters, uh, looking at all the, the pros and cons and the pitfalls, the considerations, and they agreed that the proposal was worth of further consultation. They enlarged the pool from six to 18, and they started speaking to Grand Lodge and Provincial Grand Lodge. Resulting from these meetings, uh, our meeting was held with Provincial Grand Secretary, and he advised those Bern that the Provincial Grand Chaplain, Brother Reverend Robin Trotter, was actually a member of a dormant lodge, dormant lodge, uh, and one of the other past masters, Brother Bill Black, stayed in Edinburgh. That lodge name was Hope. His number was 337, and it used to meet in Karachi. Now, Robin Trotter was uh, an affiliate of uh, Lodge Castle Dower in Fife and Kinross, but his mother lodge was Schoon in Perth, up in Perthshire. Uh, but when he was out in Pakistan, he was a missionary brand, a very interesting character. And I think Nobby and I were both privileged to, to know him, and some of, some of you may remember uh, Brother Trotter. Uh, that application for repondment was presented to the steering committees. There was further meetings and uh, a meeting uh, was held on the 11th of November 1988 and Brother James Malcolm Marcus Humphrey of Dinnett and our uh, Right Worshipful Provincial Grand Master, the Right Honourable the Earl of Elgin and Car Carton carried out the ceremony of reponing the lodge. Uh, Marcus Humphrey at the time was our Grand Master Mason. And there's some photographs, Bern. Uh, there's 103 opponent members from 31 different lodges, and we had 16 members from the original lodge over in Pakistan. This is Bill Black uh, and uh, Hugh Monroe, our first master. Uh, John Kirkcaldy, uh, one of the drivers. John's our deputy master. And John Martin. Uh, John and Jock were the driving forces behind it. This is the Reverend Trotter. And then the unmistakable figures of Marcus Humphrey and Brother Lord Delgan there. Uh, this was the, the, the first office bearers uh, seated. And you can see a, a good amount of office bearers, Brian, what we would love to have them today. And here are the original members. Many of them passed the Grand Lodge above, Brian, but some of them still here in good form, conducting their Freemasonry in the province of Fife and Kinross. The aims of the lodge, uh, to not compete with sister lodges by not meeting on the same night and only meeting five times a year, uh, by taking members as affiliates only. Uh, Master Masons can be affiliates of any number of lodges and the original, original or opponent members. Uh, constitutionally, we can still admit a new Mason, uh, but our joining fee, a uh, 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 fee for admission is a thousand pounds and that is to discourage people uh, from uh, joining us. Uh, to preserve knowledge and perform the unusual by creating lectures, forming book of lectures with no limit to its numbers, uh, by Brian not wishing to participate but have a collection of unusual, different, old, very old and even new lectures, by performing with no fixed team, uh, the office bearers are not wholly the lodge, all members would or could be active by choice. Uh, by allotting meetings to lectures of specific Masonic interest uh, and various uh, specific office bearers. Uh, to preserve the ancient customs of ritual and harmony, 
by not rushing to shortcut the degrees, by dressing in evening suits or evening national dress, black tie, bow ties, white gloves, very formal, Graham. Uh, by sitting down after our own lodge meetings to a proper dinner and observing the ancient toasts. Uh, by Brian learning and being encouraged to perform lectures and general information. Uh, by providing the facility with willing guiding hands to research and discover the beauty of Freemasonry. Promoting, creating, preserving, imparting research of Freemasonry for Freemasonry, for Freemasons. So Brian, to me that, that sounded like a daily advancement. And we know when we look at the, the, the fellow craft degree, uh, it commends us to study the liberal arts and sciences, which are grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And when we study the historical background for this list, we'll uncover layers of Masonic meanings for us in each of the seven areas of knowledge. But specifically for me, Brian, uh, uh, as uh, a research lodge, to me it's grammar, logic, and rhetoric are, are the, the three main ones that we're dealing with. Knowledge, facts, data, terms, basic skill. Logic, understanding how the facts fit together the what and the why, and rhetoric, wisdom, proper use of the knowledge and understanding. Put all those together, true learning is mastery. And over the years, since Rapone McBrown, we've had 141 lecturers. We've hosted 10 symposiums, uh, and we were the forerunner, uh, again at the vanguard of providing Masonic symposiums. Uh, the International Conference in the History of Freemasonry followed on from us. We've had three presentation degrees of older unusual workings, including a demonstration by Romanian Brown, not sure that long ago. And we've had three questions and answer sessions looking at the future. We've always been as a lodge at the vanguard of Masonic learning. And there's a, a, a copy of uh, our symposium, symposium from 2006 and 2005. And one of the things that we put in place, Brown, uh, the halfway through was a young Mason's degree uh, and if you look at the majority of these, Brian, uh, some will be well kent. Uh, there's Ian Coburn, who's now a substitute provincial grandmaster uh, of Fife and Kinross. Um, Billy Donaldson, who's still a member of the lodge, uh, and a few others uh, that are still going about, Brian, that you will know of. So bringing on young masons has always been at the heart and educating them of what we do. What? Well, a few years ago, we recognised that the Lodge had a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities. Uh, and when I, I, I ascended, to, ascended to the Chair of King Solomon, uh, along with the support of the Nobby Clark, Martin Green, Alan Turton, etc., we, we, we looked at what the, the challenges and opportunities for us were. And one of the things that, that I wanted to, to do was to, to re-engage and reconnect with uh, our Brown in India. And I'd met Bommy Meta a few times, and uh, we we were trying to get him to come and present a lecture, his lecture on Freemasonry in India. And uh, I, I'm delighted, Brian, to say that we managed to get him to come along. And you can see Bommy there. Uh, and on that occasion, uh, Alexander had been given a, a casket, and you can just about see it—a a silver casket that had been in the possession of the Eglinton family. And uh, he wanted to present that back to Grand Lodge and a deputation, John Herrick led it, came along uh, to, to listen to Bommie's presentation. And we were able to present that and the, the inscription and the scroll that was in it. And I think that made Bommie's night seeing that piece of history. But then we, we just surpassed that by making him an honorary member of, to him, the oldest lodge in India. One of the other things that uh, we, we recognised was that we didn't have a full history of the lectures that we presented since repolement because we'd lost some of our minute books. Uh, thankfully, over the last couple of years, we've been able to pull them back and we now have a full list. Uh, our lodge regalia was uh, in a bit of a shambles there. People had joined the lodge, moved away, uh, and uh, again, possibly because it wasn't the mother lodge, it was uh, not the same care and attention. And we wanted to encourage a new crop of affiliates. Did we manage that over the last few years, Brian? Yeah, we got Bommy. Uh, we made him an honorary member. What a great night that was. Uh, we now have a full history and we've inaugurated the Reverend Robin Trotter annual lecture. And that's specifically for, for new Masonic researchers and lecturers to come along and give them an opportunity in a safe environment to present their lecture. We've still not got the regalia sorted out, Brian. 
and we've not been able to uh, affiliate anybody, but we know not why. Uh, our April 2019 was to be my last meeting in the chair and we had a fantastic presentation by Brother Stephen McGregor uh, about the widow's sons. Uh, and I was in to come out of the chair and be initiated into my mother lodge for its centenary year. However, a global pandemic was upon us. And what did that mean for Freemasonry Brown? It meant we were closed due to the corona coronavirus. We came across something called Zoom. Uh, and I think we all thought Zoom was a, a lion's made ice lolly. Uh, or a little chip of chocks lolly or something that you put on the end of a camera. Uh, and it was just last year, uh, a new description of Zoom has been entered in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, but it was this type of Zoom, online meetings. And you can see one of the very early meetings there. I know some of you are, are here this evening. Uh, and this technology in many ways has revolutionized Freemasonry. And on the 23rd of March, 2020, 23 months, 22 months ago, Brown, we initiated and we held our first Zoom meeting. Uh, and it was a, a conversation uh, and it was to see if we could beat self-isolation. We thought we were only going to be isolated down for about four or five weeks. Uh, can we combat any loneliness that we would have, keep the lodge in contact with each other and ensure that the camaraderie that we had uh, was still there? And keep that daily advancement in Masonic knowledge going. We agreed that we should, and we invited on the 31st of March, Bob Cooper to come along, and he presented to us his musings on William Shaw. Today, Brian, this evening, this is a 100 Zoom meeting. And since then, we've had 99 lectures from 77 different speakers from France, Philippines, Canada, the US, Germany, Ireland, Trinidad and Tobago, India, Israel, Sri Lanka, Greece, England, Scotland, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Africa and Sweden. We would never have been able to do that if we were meeting in our traditional way, Brian, and the amount of people and Brian that we've met. We've had Masonic visitors from all of the above and the following. Chile, Romania, Italy, Poland, Hong Kong, Singapore, and some of you are here this evening. <clears throat> We've had a diverse range of subjects. Freemasonry in the military, histories of provinces and lodges, Freemasonry in various countries, Freemasonry in the war years, famous Freemasons, early Scottish Freemasonry, Jacobites, and many, many more various subjects. We decided not to explore ritual. Masonic secrets, Masonic higher side degrees, and Masonic taboo subjects such as politics and religion, although at times they maybe uh, touched in at the edges. Others followed our lead. The Internet Lodge started a weekly lecture series, Ontario Masons, uh, Virginia Research Lodge, Australia New Zealand Masonic Research Council, Freemasons Without Borders, uh, Barra Epo. I set up a conversation with him I, and the District Grand Lodge of India, the United Grand Lodge of India. I, our district in Lebanon had series. So the Lodge Hope of Karachi inspired others to do what we were doing. We held a, a research lodge, Blue Sky Day, and we brought the research lodges, 27 participants together. I, we defined the research lodge, we based it on uh, James Douglas's paper that he'd written 31 years prior. Uh, we talked about the rules of engagement. Nothing's a bad idea. It's not about Hope Karachi. This is about uh, making education more accessible for the Scottish craft. We set up our Masonic Esoteric Symposium because one of the things we learned from the weekly lockdown lecture that when we had some of the esoteric speakers, so the subject matter was quite deep. So we felt that we'd bring that away. So that was a Saturday afternoon. It was a five hour session and it went on to become our most viewed on our YouTube channel. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had our second esoteric symposium. And again, this is rapidly becoming one of the most watched on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel. Uh, 
something that again was breaking new ground and of the 99 lectures that I've talked about Brian, uh, 96 of them are available for the public because they don't go into the secret so it helps uh, engage with the, the wider community or the profane uh, with what Freemasonry is all about and it puts us in a good light and when you look at the, the analytics uh, since we, we set this up in June 2020 18 months ago, Brown, we've had 17,907 views, over 3,000 hours of watching time, and we've got 529 subscribers to the channel. That's people who look for the updates. That's not people who come in and out or find it. It's been uh, a blessing for me in many ways. In my own daily advancement, I've researched, prepared, and delivered lectures on a variety of subjects. Many of you have heard them. And I've also been privileged to represent the Lodge in the province and the Scottish craft uh, around the world with those presentations from Canada, Romania, the States, Mauritius, uh, here at home in Scotland and Ireland, South Africa and down south in England. But our future, hopefully, I've still got hopefully up, but I know we're meeting, uh, back to face-to-face -to -face meetings with our installation in February, uh, just a few weeks away, Brown, to which each and every one of you are invited. But face-to-face -face meetings and normality, whatever the new normal will be, comes with a commitment to continue our Zoom programme of lectures for those that want this type of Freemasonry. They won't be weekly, Brian. They may be monthly, at the very least quarterly, and we will continue and possibly develop other symposium types, uh, half-day sessions for other subjects. The next one is likely to be a uh, military uh, masonry. So February, I uh, Three weeks, uh, two weeks on Saturday, Brian, a new master, Brother Kevin Thompson, who is known to many of you, uh, again, uh, a well-renowned uh, uh, Masonic researcher and presenter. So I'd like to say thank you all for listening to my Masonic, Masonic musings and ramblings over the, the last uh, 22 months, Brian. But more importantly, thank you all for the support that you've given. Uh, we could not have done it without you being here to present to. My thanks go particularly to John Kirkcaldy, John Martin, Robin Trotter and Bill Black, who are no longer with us, sadly. Nobby, uh, our immediate past master. Our lecturers and our audiences, and Brother Bommy Mehta uh, for the history of the Scottish Freemasonry in India, who's now an honorary member of our lodge. Brian, with these few words, thank you. Brother Gordon. Thank you very much indeed for uh, giving us your 10th lecture out of 100 uh, <coughs> and some more t statistics for you. If you had been the, the master for four meetings, that was one year, but for 100, that's the equivalent of 25 years meetings. <laughs> um, and it's been a pleasure, uh, Gordon, to be your secretary over the last, uh, how many years it is? Three. Um, I didn't hear grey hair when I started this burn. Yeah, neither did Not I. Know <laughs> All right. Now, I think there may be a couple of questions, Gordon. Um, Ron Mann, strange to have Aden and India under one jurisdiction. Well, it may have been because of proximity rather than anything else, because that was the two British uh, domains at that time in that area. And it was only a short journey away. It was a stopping off point as well. Yeah. Um, Felix Lodge, number 355, was opened in Aden in August 1850. And that was from uh, past master uh, Michael Hearn of that lodge, which now meets in Aberdeenshire, I believe. Um, pioneer, pioneer, pioneer met as well in Aden, and there are sister lodge in Linlithgow Yeah, um, yeah we, we meet in Peter Kuta actually. Peter Kuta, which is just on the outskirts of, of Aberdeen. 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 Yeah, um, I've been to a lodge there, Peter Kuta lodge. Um, the Michael's also saying the twenty second regiment of foot is a uh, lodge number two five one in the role of the Grand Lodge Island. Charles Stewart made, made, put, put a comment. Uh, now, I might get this wrong because my Latin's pretty poor, Charles. Percivi, 
the Latin for I have sinned was the punning one word telegram which uh, General Sir Charles Napier announced to the world his, 19, his 1843 capture of Sindh or Sindh province. Um, another interesting fact about uh, General Sir Charles Napier, uh, he also has a statue on the same uh, square as a naval chap, Trafalgar Square. Yep. Um, the Masonic units in Pakistan were instructed to close in 1971 as per an edict from the then President Ali Bhutto. Uh, there was a specific reason why this was done. Michael, what was the specific reason? You obviously know. Yeah, basically, um, I'm a member of the affiliate member of Jubilee Masters Lodge in London. And there we used to have a, a wonderful brother called uh, Bright Working <coughs> Brother Rohim Tumkambata. He was the past District Grand Master of the District Grand Lodge of Pakistan under the English Constitution. He was a medical doctor and also the cardiologist to Ali Bhutto. Uh, Ali Bhutto, as we know, was the um, if you like, force behind closing the Masonic Lodges so, throughout the whole of Pakistan. Now, what we don't realise is that Pakistan had fought a very destructive and costly war against India, and financially it was broke. Now, what they had, luckily, was another country that bailed them out financially, and that was Saudi Arabia. But they imposed certain conditions on that bailout, and one of those was no Freemasonry. Uh, another one was the actual adoption of Shaharia law. Now, apparently, this was written in a letter to Ali Bhutto from the uh, Saudis, for which uh, Dr. Kambasa was actually shown it and he saw it and he said, Ali Bhutto was of the view, well, I'm sorry, you lot have got to close. Now, obviously, that threw, as I say, the cat amongst the pigeons, so, so to speak, because not only were a lot of units closed, but as we know, the buildings were sequestered and a lot of the contents in terms of um, artifacts and other possessions of individuals, as well as documentation, was also, as I say, sequestered as well. Now, I'd like to think that those particular documents are still there, uh, although, if you like, still under lock and key. And I understand that there have been, over the past, a number of court cases to try and uh, get those particular documents returned to their rightful owners. But interestingly, there's a Knights Templar Preceptory under the English Constitution called um, Balochistan Preceptory Number 188, that did in actual fact meet, as I say, uh, in Pakistan before it uh, decided to uh, return back to uh, England. It now currently meets, as I say, in London. But I was fortunate enough to have a number of uh, contact, uh, a number of sorry, interactions with uh, Dr. Kambata. Uh, he was a very interesting man. And sadly, he uh, passed through Grand Lodge above in, I think, December 2019. But he was a very interesting man to talk to. You know, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thanks, mate. Michael. Um, uh, a comment from Ian McIntosh. Well done to you, Gordon, for organising the lectures and your credit to Hope and the craft. Um, Jim Beveridge, thank you very much for all the effort you put into this fabulous weekly lecture. Charles Stewart, can you go back to the slide just before the mention of esoteric, Gordon? It was a comment in bottom left hand corner. Um, Lord Secretaries need to give full minutes to allow primary search in the future. Over the last few years, I've been involved with the book checking within Edinburgh. And one of the things that did strike me was, in some cases, almost paucity of information that's in the minutes and thinking in terms of it being part of social history. And to, to just record this absolute minimum of detail wouldn't help folks in future years to investigate the life of the Lodge. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that comment. Oh, Charlie, yeah, I think you know my, my views on that. I, I am anti-copy and paste. I, I prefer minutes to be 
handwritten, even if it's a, a unintelligible scroll like that I've got, because the secretary can bring the lodge to life for the researcher in years to come. Uh, when we get into this copy and paste and we're just changing the names of the degrees and the, the candidates, uh, you, you, you don't bring it to life. Uh, and that, I think, uh, the, the, the experience that we, we strive for just now to get through the business so we can get through for a pint a pint uh, is going to be uh, damaging for the, the history of the craft in 50, 100 years' time so when we look back. Uh, and if you've got a secretary who's prepared to handwrite it and write it out in full, that's great. Nothing to say that that then can't be uh, scanned or copied somehow and sent out so the brand can read it at their leisure. But well done, George. That's the way to do it. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a it's a, a, a soapbox of mine, Charles. I would say. And when, when I was in the position that you were. Uh, going around the province of Fife and Kinross and doing books inspection, etc. Uh, there is one lodge uh, here uh, that has got a beautiful set of minutes, but again, uh, the, the calligraphy in it and the little pictures that he drew in it uh, when he had the time, uh, it just made those books stand out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am certainly not an advocate of uh, electronic minutes in any way, shape or form. Minute book that you just spoke about, Gordon, with the illustrations, it's something to behold. It, it certainly is, yeah. And it's Lodge Castle Dourburn, if anybody's interested in you actually go and visit it. Uh, there was a period of about 10 years, the secretary at the time uh, was into that. Uh, and uh, many of his uh, little drawings are, are to be finished. Uh, they're, they're sketched out, but uh, that's where it is. So. Um, a comic, Gordon, from Gordon uh, from Ron Mann. Well done, Gordon. You have done us proud over the past two years. Uh, uh, from Slider, uh, we, well we done, Gordon. Skip, Credit. skip all those ones, Nobby. <laughs> oh, sorry. Am I not taking this meeting tonight? Oh, sorry, Master. Um, uh, well, from Ian, when 337 moved to Rosyth, I seem to remember there was some talk that they would move around the province. Uh, I I've yeah, been domiciled in Rosai for some time now and seem happy and successful. Is there any way, anything? I, th I think the, the, the original, having spoken to John and Jock and uh, I, a few of the original boys, it, they, there was always that thought that it would be, uh, have the opportunity to travel around the province. Uh, and over the years, Brian, we, we originally met in Elgin's Lodge at Leaven. Uh, we then moved to the, the Charter Club in Kirkcaldy, and for the last 10 years we've been in a, the Admiralty Road Masonic Trust, but we've also held meetings in Lodge Torrey uh, for our symposium and Saint, Lodge St. Clara Dyes for our young members meetings. Uh, I, I think Ian, it, it ain't broke just now, uh, but I think uh, it's good for it to move around because uh, but it needs to go to a place where it's got it's readily accessible. So we wouldn't want to take it out to the East Newt because it gives people an excuse not to go. And the closer it is to the bridges, the easier it is to get Brian who may want to come across or on that motorway network. It's easy for them to, to nip down from Inverness, Alec Cray, uh, or Claudio uh, to fly into Edinburgh. Uh, who knows what the future will hold? But uh, who knows, Ian? Uh, just now, we're, I think we're quite happy where we are. Yeah, it's got a lot to be said for the, the, the connectivity, uh, Gordon, of where we are. Um, you're right what you're saying. The East Nook people use it as an excuse not to go there. And there's nothing to say. There's nothing nice to go to East Nook for not only the fish and chips, but the friendship along there. Um, Just if the parking was a bit better, we'd be the only thing. <laughs> there's parking round the back. If you're early. Oh, no, there's always plenty of parking round the back. Um, uh, uh, Bob Kerr, thank you, Gordon, for uh, George. Thanks, Gordon, for all your uh, enjoyable and informative presentations. Uh, Alec Crave, thanks, Gordon, for all who have assisted you and Robert over the period. I have been most entertained and enlightening for me most Tuesdays. I look forward to continue to join us in meetings and hope to get the opportunity to join you all in person at your lodge. Uh, 
taken sand back. Uh, imitation is the best form of flattery, as worshipable master the Richard Sandback Lodge of Research, 9,600 English Constitution based in Peterborough. I introduced a series of lectures on Masonic history, but we, we did seven monthly lectures. That was enough of a commitment, but 100. Well done, Gordon, and Lodge Hope of Karachi. Incidentally, Richard Sandback, my father, was in the Cheshire Regiment during World War II. Oh, that's an interesting fact. And, and, and Bren, I, I've actually behind me, I've got one of Richard Sandbach's books uh, because he was a prominent Freemason in his own right, uh, as his son is, and uh, I, I believe he's Provincial Grand Master uh, as well of one of the, the provinces down there, Dickon, uh, Cheshire Way. Uh, no, no, Hamptonshire and Huntingdonshire. There you go. And... Uh, <laughs> He headed, headed up the Rose, Rose Choir in England for a couple of years as well later on. So he's quite eminent in his own right. Yeah. So uh, he, he sits behind me someplace <laughs> on the shelf. So, <laughs> watching what you're doing. <laughs> uh, Michael Monroe, very good presentation, Gordon. Martin Gunn, thanks for everything you've done for all the fantastic lectures given. And thank you to all the Reverend uh, that gave those lectures and thanks from. Thanks for my daily advancement. And that's all the quotes, questions, etc. that I have, unless you've got any that were sent direct to you, Master. No, none. none. That's fine. Well, Brian, th thank you so much. And thank you for uh, allowing me to, to give you my, my wanderings and my ramblings again. And for uh, everyone staying with us this evening, it's always a, a, a sense of relief for the the. the the presenter that we he starts with the same amount that uh, he finishes with. Uh, not always the case when I'm rambling, but hey ho. But thank you, Brian. Next week will be our 101st and final lockdown lecture, and I'm delighted to announce that Brother Alan Beck will come back and end the lockdown lecture series with a interesting tale about Robert Burns, but not specifically about Robert Burns, but about the movement that surrounds Robert Burns today and its Masonic involvement. And to me, that is probably the best way to finish uh, our series of lectures uh, and talking about probably our greatest and most famous Masonic export, Robbie Burns. So Brian, uh, it be a great delight to see you next Tuesday for the last time before we get back to our normality of meeting face-to-face -face with our lodges. Thank you, one and all, for coming along. And Nobby in particular, thank you to you for everything that you do behind the scenes. Thank you, Brian. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Gordon. I uh, look forward to the next meeting. Uh, unfortunately, you're saying it won't be the last, but who knows? We'll have either monthly or quarterly going forward, Jim. So there will be something because there's too many brethren that are stuck at home and they don't get their masonry. And this is their only way of connecting. Very true. Cheers, Gordon. Thank you very much. Good night, all. Good night, Jim. Good night, Jim. Good night. Jim. Good night. Good night. Good well done. Good well done. Good well done, Gordon. Take care, brother. Thank you. Can I just ask? Oh, Jim, I didn't have yeah. When you have these other lectures, will you be sending out all the members still but we, on you. yeah we, we will do what we've always done on the facebook we'll put the announcements out uh, and we, we will uh, push that through uh, the email list that we've developed as well because we've now developed an email list in excess of 100 names on it Brian, which is fantastic uh, that we never had uh, and again the, the the that extends to coming along to our meetings uh, and we will advertise through the Newsletter, the email list, what what our speakers are at the meetings as well. Fine, because I don't do Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Gordon. Good night, everybody. Much appreciated. Good night, Good night. Much appreciated. Good night everyone. For all you've done. Good night, Alec. Good night. No. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, well, well done once thank again, Gordon. Gordon. Thank you. Well done, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. Well, well. I know thank you doesn't seem a lot, but you have been a star for taking all this on. How we have done it, I don't know. I salute you, Gordon. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gordon. Bye bye. Well Thank, Thank you, Gordon, and good night. Cheers, Ron. And good with night. that, then. Thank you, Gordon. Cheers, Gordon. I'll give you five. Good night, all. Oh, stay safe. Nice and slide out. And two. <laughs> good night, Gordon. Thank you to Gordon and Robbie. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Yeah.